Oh, amazing. Thank you. This is so great. Okay, one more. Excellent. <laughs> Amazing. I love that. And that's what I love about haikus. They can be silly, somber, mood setting. I love seeing people tap out the syllables on their thighs. I'm very familiar with that, like always counting. It's, it's surprising how hard it is sometimes to count the syllables. Um, I really, really appreciate this. And I would encourage you all to share your haikus later today. Maybe come up to me afterwards because I'd love to hear more of them. So I want to take us into um, a take-home creative challenge next. And this one, uh, we're not gonna have time to do in person, but I wanna give you homework for later. So I'm not sure if you've ever heard of a diamond poem or diamante poem. It's traditionally a seven-line poem where the first line is one word, then two words, three, four, three, two, one. It forms the shape of a diamond. And it doesn't have to be seven lines. Um, it can be as many as you want or as few as you want as long as it follows that general structure. So keeping that vulnerability theme going, I'm going to share a terribly emo poem with you from 2004 when I was in high school and I wrote, stop, the beat of my heart is too fast when you leave and take my air. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I shared it on Instagram because I used it as a throwback Thursday version for one of my creative challenges where I published poems for 100 days. Um, but for a more contemporary example, I uh, actually, when I just told you I came back from a trip to Portugal, and plane rides are always a really creative time for me. Maybe it's just because I feel like I have this time where I can't really do anything else, but I always like to put pen to paper, and it's not usually very good, but it's just something to keep my hands moving. So this one is not a diamond poem yet, but I'll share with you this sort of crappy first draft. It goes, flight path, right track, sky high, fly by, hours obliterated by time zones, days robbed and regiven, Plentiful strangers existing together, the voluntary containment happily constrained in a large silver bird, heavier than anything natural, walls thin as thick pancakes. But we sign up, we wonder too much, what's on the other side? So I wrote this just like word association, just for fun, but on my way home from my trip when I was starting to think about this talk, I wondered if maybe I could make it better by rewriting it in the diamond structure. So this is what I came up with. It's a little bit better. Flight, sky high, we fly by, days robbed and regiven, hours obliterated by time zones, plentiful strangers existing together, the voluntary containment, happily constrained escape. So it's kind of cool to pare away all the stuff that's like really not that good and leave the gems, the diamond that remains, uh, which I thought was really fun. So as a take home challenge for you all, perhaps you will choose to write a diamond poem from scratch or take an existing piece of prose or any kind of writing at all and rewrite it in this structure. For a final take home challenge, I'd love you all to try to be mindful today of symmetry. Look for examples in your walk back to the office, maybe your drive home tonight. You can seek out symmetry in architecture, in nature, people walking by in their outfits, anything at all. And I would encourage you to take a photo of it and capture it. I did that recently on my last morning in Lisbon. I was inspired to take this photo. Not a photographer, not the best, but it struck me. Uh, I loved the symmetry of the window panes, but then I was also equally struck by the asymmetry between the church on the left-hand side and the rolling hills on the right, as well as the light bulb on the left and the handle of the window on the right there as well. So why do I show you this pretty awful photo? Because sharing is caring, guys. <laughs> It really is. So first of all, congratulations to all of you for having created something before 10 a.m. on a Friday. You've done more today than what many people do in their whole lives creatively, and that's not a lie. Um, so I also would encourage you to be vulnerable and share one thing. It can be your doodle, maybe it's your haiku, perhaps it's a photo from later on today, but if you do, 
feel free to tag hashtag CM Symmetry. Ottawa is creative, I love that. I feel like we should all keep trying to keep making that hashtag a thing. Um, you can tag the Ottawa Creative Warning Crew and I would love if you tagged me as well just because I'm really curious about what you all came up with. So that uh, is an open challenge to all of you. So some closing thoughts real quick. I, I think a lot of people in this world are happy living symmetrical lives. The lives that people think that they should live, the lives that look like everyone else. Symmetry is beautiful, it's pleasing to the eye, but it's not challenging. You've figured out one side and you've figured out it all. I think that us in the room this morning, we are the symmetry breakers. I think we're the ones who fight against symmetry, intentionally and unintentionally. And I think there's something beautiful about that. So it's easy to see why people want symmetry. It's perfection and it's easy to get stuck in the art of trying to be perfect. But I'll share one more quote because I love it by Elizabeth Gilbert, who's an author I also love. I think perfectionism is just fear in fancy shoes and a mink coat. <laughs> So I'm not saying that you shouldn't seek balance in your lives. Absolutely, you should seek out symmetry and so that you can feel like you're a balanced human being. But I also would say, don't be afraid to lean a little further on one side of the line and don't be afraid to share the creative creations that result when you do. Thank you. When she came to town, if you know, you know, I guess, yeah. Um, as you know, Courtney was the interviewee, I suppose, the interviewer. I was the interviewer. <laughs> um, and I was blown away because she did a better job than Girl Boss. Sorry, I said that you did. So I am honored and terrified to be on your side this time. And oh, I'd yeah. like to just start off with a question about you. I noticed you didn't share much about you at all um, in that talk. So I'm curious as to, you know, what is, like, what do you do? How did you end up there? Um, what motivates you? Pick one of those. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I'm always trying to find ways to write. And I originally thought that being a journalist would be a really good way to do that. So I went, my family lives near Toronto. I moved to Ottawa to go to journalism school. And I, I loved it. I started as a community reporter, which is this weirdly validating experience where very few people read your paper, but the ones that do frame the articles and put them on the fridge about their son in like the local fairs pumpkin growing contest or whatever it is, it means so much to them. So I really loved how people invited me into their homes and I had so much free reign. I wrote like a first person narrative about what it was like to learn to sail a sailboat. Full disclosure, I didn't like really learn, but I had, I spent a couple of hours and I tried it. Um, so that was really fun. And then I transitioned into uh, business journalism after actually losing my job. The newspaper I was at collapsed into another, as we see so often in the media industry right now. And I was sort of just set adrift. Um, and that was really hard, but I found footing working at the Ottawa Business Journal. And that was such a strange victory for me because I knew nothing about business. I knew nothing about technology, which was my beat. I was like, yeah, I'm a technology reporter. Sure, of course I am. Uh, and I just sort of learned as I went. And that eventually led me to where I am now at Shopify, uh, where I am a ghostwriter, actually. So I write in the voice of other people. And it's really nice to be able to spend at least some time every single day writing. But like I said, there's always room for, for my own voice. I need to make sure I, I don't lose that along the way, I feel. So fake it till you make it? It's more like not even fake it. It's more just like mm, admit that we're all students always, even the people that have been doing it for years and decades. Like the year that you stop viewing yourself as a student is the year that just nobody wants to hang out with you anymore. So just remembering that we always all have something to learn and as long as you're receptive and you take the lessons and you're not afraid of getting feedback, even if it feels like a little hard sometimes, um, then as long as you keep trying, then that's, you're good to go. Fair, I love that. Mm -hmm. um, for one more from me and then hopefully some from you. Um, Marwan is standing by with the mic, so we'll go 
Just raise your hand um, and he'll come by with the mic. So last one, uh, you quickly touched on this idea of ghostwriting, which I find really interesting, um, kind of embodying a different a, a voice. Like I wonder, um, what does it take to do something like that? Are you like always following Toby's footsteps and knowing everything that he thinks? Like how do you kind of get into his mindset? Yeah, so I have been working with uh, Toby, the CEO of Shopify, as his ghostwriter. And it's a, it's a weird term because no one likes to think, oh, he doesn't write his own things. That's not really true. It's very much a collaboration. And he is a very gifted writer, but uh, he just has a million other things that he's very responsible for doing. So I sort of help him get all his crazy ideas in his head down on paper. And the best way that I've learned to help with that is uh, when I started, I created what I call the Toby Repository. And so I went combed through every interview he's ever done, everything he's ever written, everything he's ever said and tweeted, and I alphabetized it by topic <laughs> with a link so that I can pull upon things that he's already said and thought and done so that I'm not ever inventing anything for him. It's literally that I'm just helping him synthesize his thoughts and ideas in places that they already exist. And uh, that's been a really, it was a really rewarding way to, to start things off, so I really felt comfortable. And then you really just have to not be embarrassed to show something to someone. Like, it's very daunting. Imagine me writing something and being like, this is you. you like, this is your voice. What do you think? It's so easy to be like, no, I would never write it like that. It's just, it's, it can be tricky. Um, but we figured out a good collaborative working relationship where it's never that I'm going rogue. We're very much working together, and it feels really good. Wonderful. So we'll open up to you now if you have any questions for Courtney. Just throw up your hand. Come on, there's got to be. Got you all prepped. Who's one? Oh, there we go. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're called Mike Runners. This is going to be somewhat unrelated, but cool. in the email that went out, it said that you live in a log cabin. I'd love to hear about that. <laughs> I do, actually. So I live just south of the city in a village called Metcalf. It's about a 25-minute drive if I don't have traffic. And it is just that. It's a, a log home. Uh, it was built by the previous owners. And they're just like the biggest, roundest logs you can imagine on all four sides. There's a, a porch going around three of the sides. And it's super rustic. Log homes are actually a lot harder to maintain than you think. I was just like, it's beautiful. It'll last forever. But you have to stain it and treat it and make sure it's like windproof and waterproof and sunproof and all these things. But um, I've always loved having the combination of working downtown in the city and having all the energy that a city offers, but then being able to retreat and go somewhere quiet and have another way to recharge my batteries, especially creatively. And uh, I do a lot, it's so cliche, but I do so much writing on the front porch uh, of my log home. So I, yeah, it's a, a really fun experience, especially right now in the winter when snow falls, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. You used all your creativity with that. <laughs> I drained them. Oh, sort of oh yay, there's a couple more. Hi. Hi. Uh, so based on symmetry, like reach to like balance, and then you know the idea of like common business where like your thoughts need to match your behaviors. Yes. So that I actually was thinking a lot about for this talk, and specifically I was thinking about how it applies to social media. So I keep talking about this trip I just came back from, because it was so much fun, but I consciously, while I was there, made a point of not being on social media. So I didn't publish any photos. I, did, I took a bunch of bad ones, as I shared, but I didn't um, publish any of them. Because I was just trying to experiment and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't putting out this image of like, look how perfect my life is. I do these wonderful <laughs> things and everyone should be jealous of my life because we know that things can be so curated online. And so I've swung to different extremes. I mean, when I do my creative challenges, I'm posting once every single day because it's part of the challenge. It's not really me, it's more my, my writing works. It feels a little different, but then I swing the other way. And you'll notice whenever I finish a challenge, I'm like, 
nope. Like, I just won't publish for weeks at a time. I won't share anything. So now I'm like kind of bringing it back to the middle. Again, it's a balance. And as long as I'm being true to who I am as a real person right now sitting here, then I'm fully comfortable sharing things and being like, hey, this is my life. Maybe you want a peek into it. Um, but yeah, I would just encourage everyone to kind of do an audit of like, how does this make you feel? Do you, do you feel good when you share these things or do you feel depressed because you're trying to pretend to be these things and you're not? Um, I feel like social media should enhance our lives and it shouldn't make us feel shittier about ourselves. So just trying to find that middle ground. I've been working on that. Hi. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Hi. Uh, you touched quickly on it being your fourth 100 Days Project. For people taking this on for the first time and looking to keep motivated to do the full 100 days, what would you suggest? Okay. Definitely choose something that will only take you between 5 to 15 minutes a day. Because otherwise, I've seen people sign themselves up for like one hour of making every day. And it's like, <laughs> No, nobody's got time for that. Some days you will, but then you'll just feel defeated on the days that you won't. So something that you can just fit within a small gap of time that you really do feel is achievable. Another thing too, and this was actually uh, new advice to me, is to ch choose something that's generative. And by that I mean like don't start from scratch every day. Choose a theme for yourself or choose like something out of a hat every day. Like give yourself a writing prompt every day that can help dictate, sorry, not just writing, I'm so biased. Whatever, a design prompt, a photography prompt, something that helps you have a, a place to start from so that every single day you're not like, oh my God, I could write about everything. Like I've learned that there's so much creativity in constraint. Sometimes having a box, you can like flirt with the edges, but like at least it's like a, a playing field that you know you're gonna show up in. Um, and tell people that you're gonna do it. That public accountability factor really helps, whether or not it should. I mean, I should just do it for my own damn self, I know, but like when I tell people I'm gonna do it, like I'm doing right now for all of you, it's a really good motivator to be like, I am a person of my word. I will do this. <laughs> so, yeah. I really hope you decide to do one. That'd be awesome. Was there one last hand I think I saw? Same row? Yeah. Thanks for the great talk. Um, oh, thanks. Uh, it's kind of close from the last question. Um, I was wondering if you have any particular rituals or. I have a bizarre ritual where I love the bathtub. It's, it's a weird place, but I like, I, it's kind of weird and formulaic. I like take a big tray and I load it up with like chocolate and tea and wine and water and candles and a book light and my book and a notebook and just all kinds of things. It's a big tray and I bring it up. And I like turn on the water, turn off the lights, turn on the candles, and I just sort of just sit with my thoughts. I find that if I force myself to be in a closed space where I don't promise that I'll do anything else but right, um, that is, is key. And then also just knowing that like the first thing you write is never going to be amazing. Oh, maybe it will, but just don't be afraid to write anything down. Half the stuff in my notebooks is just garbage, but it's a way to connect my brain to my hand to the paper. Uh, and I find that once I start writing words, even if they're nonsense words, even if they're just anything like elephant, pink, anything, then it really helps me to get going. Um, and I think it helps to just not edit as you go, just continually flow. Don't worry, you can clean things up later, but that creative muse might just like leave your head at any given moment. So I appreciate pen to paper, but if I'm having a really, you know those moments where like things just start coming really fast, I'll often like to use my notes app or a laptop then just because I can type faster than I can write. But when it's slower, like usual, I use a pen. Thank yeah. you for asking that. I'm yeah. about the creative blog Sure. And we're going to close this off. Um, but thank you so much. You did a wonderful job. I think thank we can all take it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.